Two months ago, not one of us in this tent knew that this was going to happen. And if you doubt whether there is a living God, I want to tell you that he arranged every detail of this gathering. Things that we never thought were possible just happened like clockwork. For example, I knew that we needed some really lovely music to reach our hearts tonight. And there was only one or two names in my mind when I thought of that. And so I rang through to Jerusalem and I said, is there any chance that you two could be in Finchley on June the 18th? And here they are. And it's just lovely to have them with us. And then our chairman has not introduced himself, but then he couldn't, so let me introduce you to him. This is Colonel Ord Dobby. Some of you would remember his father, General Dobby, who held Malta. But he is named Ord after his cousin, Ord Wingate, who laid the foundations of the Israeli army, including the principle that officers should be in front of their troops and not 10 miles behind them as in every other nation. But again, I didn't know he was coming, and only a few days ago he arrived, and here he is. And the Lord has just put all this together, but I want to say that the whole thing began as a vision in the heart of the young lady on my right, Barbara Watt, who didn't want to... She didn't want to sit on the platform, but um, she originally wrote and said, would I come to a church in Finchley and speak about Israel? And I said, no. But if you will find a neutral hall and invite Christians and Jews to come together, I'll gladly come. And she searched for two weeks and said, it's no good. There is not a neutral hall anywhere in Finchley. The cinemas are all carved up into little studios. The schools are full of GCE examinations. There is no neutral hall. It'll have to be Christchurch. I said, I'm sorry, nothing doing. And so she prayed to the living God. And God gave a vision of oak trees. And she and a friend who's sitting over here set off to look for some oak trees in Finchley. Now, I guess you don't have too many, but there are three, one at each corner of this triangular plot. And they found them and wondered what to do then. <laughs> and the Lord told them to open their Bible and they read, Abraham walked around the land and pitched his tent by the oaks. <laughs> and so she went and booked a marquee, but only half this size, without even planning permission from the council. <laughs> and then it just seemed to blow up in our faces, and, and we felt God was telling us twice that size. And look, I think every seat... No, there are three down here. Look, three people. Come on, you might as well sit down. We don't want anybody standing. There's one here. Well, now, Mrs. Margaret Thatcher was sitting on Saturday watching the Trooping of the Colour, and while she did so, she was discussing this meeting, for, of course, this is in her constituency. And uh, when she saw the title, The Time Has Come for Gentiles to Repay Their Debt to the Jews, her comment was, What a very good title. So that's her first comment about tonight, and here's her second she has sent a message from 10, 10 Downing Street for this evening, which just arrived just before this meeting. The government, she says, is well aware of and indeed shares the concern of the Jewish community in this country about the signs that racialist activity, including anti-Semitism, is on the increase. The Home Secretary has instituted a study of this problem with a view to considering whether new measures are needed to combat it. This study is underway, and I am pleased that the Jewish community is making a full and helpful contribution to it. I believe that it is the responsibility of all to ensure that those who seek to sow discord in our society are defeated. It is all too easy for unnecessary, irrational, and dangerous divisions to arise between the various groups within our society. I therefore welcome the initiative you have taken to make sure that we all understand the roots of our traditions and that we must work together in friendship and cooperation. I wish you every success with your evening, Margaret Thatcher. Well, I'm 
sure you would wish us on your behalf to reply to that in suitable terms. Well now, if you came here by car, you owe the development of the internal combustion engine to a Jew, you owe the discovery of petroleum to a Jew, you owe the invention of the drive-in garage to get filled up to a Jew. If you switched on your television or your radio today, you owe it to a Jew that he discovered radio waves and the speed of light and a whole host of other things. There was one time not too long ago when 24% of the world's physicists were Jewish and yet the Jews constitute 0.3% of the world's population. And it is not only in the realm of science, but in many other realms, that we Gentiles owe an incalculable debt. I could pick a lighter side like entertainment, and you know that all the five main studios of Hollywood were little Jewish colonies. And you just need to mention names like Golden and Mayer, the Marx Brothers, Barbara Streisand. You could go on and on. In the field of art, architecture, music, the names trip off your tongue. You have no difficulty in thinking of an outstanding artist. A few days ago, Mervyn Merler and I were operating together in Zurich, and I just slipped around the corner to see the Chagall windows in the Frauhausen church there, which are superb. Unfortunately, they've been smashed recently by the uh, young people's riots in Zurich, but they will be repaired beautiful works of art. I remember listening fascinated to Arthur Rubinstein already going blind but running up and down the keyboard on his legs. Not just with his hands but running up and down playing music the like of which I think I've never heard. We owe so much in education. The development of kindergarten education. The invention of Esperanto. The use of the humble quotation marks. All these we owe to Jews. But the Gentiles owe to the Jews, I think, more in the realm of medicine than in any other. And if your children have been given a polio vaccine, you owe it to a Jew that infantile paralysis is a thing of the past. It was a Jew who discovered vitamins. It was a Jew who discovered how to detect syphilis and how to cure it. It was a Jew who discovered that boiling milk made it safe. It was a Jew who discovered that the tomato was edible. It was a Jew who developed cocaine in dentistry. And if I went on like this, if you've ever taken an aspirin, you owe that to a Jew. I've already covered, I think, everybody in this tent in some particular, have I not? We could look at the field of commerce, the invention of the mail-order catalogue, the fact that 20% of the millionaires in the United States are Jewish. If you've ever worn a pair of jeans, I was looking at a photograph one hour ago of two young men by the name of Haas, who are the great-great-grand-nephews of Levi Strauss, who in 1904 advertised riveted clothing. <laughs> and the jeans were born. If I were asked who are the three men who have shaped our 20th century more than anyone else, I would have no hesitation and no difficulty in naming Sigmund Freud, Albert Einstein, and Karl Marx. I am not now discussing whether everything they did or discovered or said was good or bad. I am saying these three men shaped the 20th century. And both in the communist and the capitalist world, there is a debt to the Jew for the way we live. And none of those three could have done what they did had they been Gentile. Sigmund Freud put it on record that his study of human nature began with the Bible because he found in the Bible an honest book which revealed human nature as it really is. And he began his study of human nature with his own scriptures. Karl Marx is in a sense a prophetic heretic. His philosophy of history is identical with the prophets of the Hebrew scriptures. The only difference is that he rubbed out the word God and put in the word state. But his philosophy of history and his apocalyptic view 
of history is identical with the Old Testament prophets. And Albert Einstein searched for the secret of the unified field, believing as he did that here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, therefore there must be a universe and not a multiverse around us. Therefore there must be some simple key that would unlock the unified field of reality. And he found a very simple equation, E equals MC squared, which unpacked the atom and sent a man to the moon. I could talk to you about Hitler's cook, or Mussolini's dentist, or Abraham Lincoln's chiropodist. They are everywhere. <laughs> and yet they are 0.3% of the population. You would have thought, in view of all this and the benefits we derive from Jewish discoveries, that the world would be eternally grateful and would seek to express its gratitude in kindness. Yet the exact opposite has been true. Our modern world owes to this little people more than any other nation. And yet, Tolstoy could say this, let us see what peculiar kind of person the Jew is, which all the rulers and all the nations have together and separately abused and molested oppressed and persecuted, trampled and butchered, burned and hanged, and yet in spite of this is yet alive. The Jew is the emblem of eternity. Less than one Jew in a thousand is still living in the land where his grandfather was born, or speaking the language that his grandfather first heard. That is an extraordinary situation. Why? Why? I have discussed this phenomenon of anti-Semitism with many people. There are those who would seek to explain it simply in terms of xenophobia, the fear of the stranger, because there is something different, because the food is different, and the day of worship is different, and therefore it is simply to be explained in terms of the fact that the mob does not like the odd man out. But I don't think that comes anywhere near an adequate explanation for the extraordinary hatred and hostility that has been aroused. There are those who go a little further and say it is simply a matter of envy. Well, I looked up some figures from pre-war Germany and this is what I found in the 1930s. The Jewish population was 1% of the population of Germany, one out of every hundred. Yet listen, 10% of the doctors were Jewish, 11% of the estate agents were Jewish, 16% of the lawyers were Jewish, 17% of the bankers were Jewish, 25% of the retail trade was in Jewish hands, 30% of the clothes trade was in Jewish hands, 70% of the departmental stores were Jewish and 75% of the professors in the universities were Jewish and poor Hitler was trying to convince his people that the Germans were the superior race <laughs> now there are those who see it simply as a matter of envy and jealousy but I don't think that is enough to explain the facts I was talking to an elderly man in Jerusalem and we were discussing this and I said why have you been hated and he said, because we are just humans, only more so. And I said, what do you mean by that? Well, he said, if there are virtues in human nature, we have them too, only more so. Look at our family life, he said. And if there are vices in human nature, we have them too, only more so. If you Gentiles can be greedy, so can we. And then he said, we are therefore a distorting mirror, holding up a reflection to the human being. We reflect your vices and your virtues only more so, and nobody likes looking in the mirror. Nobody likes seeing what they're really like. I said, that's a fascinating theory, and, and I can understand it. You are human only more so. But I said, I would take that a little step further, indeed a big step further. I believe you are not only a reminder to the rest of us of the heights to which we can rise and the depths to which we can sink. You are also a reminder to us of the fact that God can raise you to those heights. 
or let you sink to those depths. And you are a reminder to us not only of what we are like, but of what he's like too. And mankind does not want to be reminded of God. We want to feel that we are autonomous, that we are landlords on planet Earth, not tenants. And so we do not like a people who remind us that God has free will. And we do not have nearly as much as he has. But there is something even deeper than that. I cannot explain the extraordinary history of your people. Unless I believe in some personal supernatural evil. And it is only then when I feel I am touching the real reason for the extraordinary desire on the part of so many nations to wipe you out. And I see behind that something supernatural and something appallingly evil. A personal power who cannot abide the thought that there is a people on earth who will convey the knowledge of God to other nations. Well, now, so far I've talked about the Gentile debt to the Jew. And it has been appallingly ill repaid. But tonight we're gathered as Jews and Christians. And I want to say to the Gentile Christians here that we are in even deeper debt to the Jew and we have repaid that debt even more shamefully. The Bible which is read every Sunday in every Christian church was written by 40 authors over a period of 1,500 years and only one of those authors was Gentile and he got all his material from Jews anyway. The other 39 were all Jewish writers And this book has come to be our most precious possession of a material kind. And we owe it to you Jews. And we have so often forgotten that. The Jesus we love was Jewish. And Christians have forgotten that. The very church was started by 12 men who were all Jews. And we have forgotten that. You would have thought that Christians through the ages would be so grateful for all they had received. Their knowledge of God would be nil unless it had come to them through Jewish channels. You would have thought that they too would have wanted to repay that debt in gratitude. If I summarize very briefly, it will have to be an oversimplification. If I summarize very briefly the last 2,000 years of the appallingly tragic gulf between Jew and Christian, it is because I want Christians here to hear my message. I'm speaking primarily to Gentiles tonight, but we're so glad to have every Jew here as an honored guest, and we want you to hear what we are coming to understand and realize. It is true that for the first 300 years of Christianity, Jews made it difficult for Christians. Partly because the Jewish religion was legally recognized by the Roman Empire and the Christian was not. And the religio licita made it difficult for the religio illicita. But I have to tell you the sad truth that when the Roman emperor became a Christian and Christianity became the established religion of that empire, the tables were turned with a vengeance, literally with a vengeance. And up till then, no church buildings could be erected. Synagogues were erected all over the empire. But from that day, no synagogues could be erected and only churches were erected. And now the boot was on the other foot and the Christians took their revenge a thousandfold. It was Christians who invented the yellow badge of disgrace for the Jew to wear, and I'm ashamed of it. But I have a deep respect for the King of Denmark, who during World War II, when the Jews of Denmark were ordered to wear that yellow badge, came out of his palace wearing a yellow badge, because he was a Gentile Christian who knew where his roots were. And every other Christian appeared in Denmark wearing that yellow badge. And as you know, that was the only country in Europe where the Nazis could not insist on that badge. But it was the Christians who invented it. And it was the Christians who walled up Jews in ghettos, which became slums, in European cities. And it was Christians who set off to liberate the holy sites in the Middle East from the Muslim 
and who got as far as Strasbourg, and the cry went up, death to the Jew. And Christians from there right to Jerusalem left a trail of Jewish blood. When they got to the holy city, they slaughtered every Jew there in the name of Jesus. I heard of a family, a Christian family, building sandcastles on the beach at Netanya, just north of Tel Aviv. And the father had just finished building what he thought was a marvelous sandcastle, and a Jewish man came and jumped on it and kicked it to pieces. And he said, why did you do that? I built that for my children. Why did you build a crusader castle with windows in the shape of a cross? It is not unrelieved gloom. There were saintly voices raised against such a thing. And there was a saint called St. Bernard of Clairvaux who said to kill a Jew is to kill a brother of Jesus. But he was a voice crying in the wilderness and no one listened. And it wasn't long after that when Jews were tortured in the name of Jesus to profess Christ in the Inquisition. And it was still being done in the name of Jesus. Now you Jews know about these things. Christians do not know about them. There's been a conspiracy of silence that has hidden the real story. I would love as a Protestant to be able to say it was the Roman Catholics who were like this in the Middle Ages. But I can't say that. I'd love to tell you that Martin Luther and Zwingli and Calvin and the Protestant reformers who rediscovered the truth of this book and rediscovered the Hebrew scriptures changed their minds and tried to repay the debt, but they did not. Martin Luther wrote a book in 1542 entitled Against Jews and Their Lies. And his last sermon, which he preached a week before he died in Germany, was a plea to Germany to get rid of every Jew in Germany. A sermon which Hitler knew about. I'd love to tell you that here in England's green and pleasant land, Jews were always welcome. But I can't tell you that. In 1291, they were all banished from these shores and couldn't get back till the days of Oliver Cromwell. And the caricature that was left during that whole period was the figure of Shylock, which William Shakespeare was responsible for. I was fascinated to see a Jewish and Israeli repertory company putting on the Merchant of Venice in Tel Aviv just a month or two ago. I thought, you must have big hearts to be able to put that on. I must tell you that in the city of York, 300 Jews were trapped and did a Masada, took their own lives rather than have British troops take them. It has happened wherever you have gone, and Christians have been in the forefront of it. I would love to tell you that the modern emancipation came in a Christian country. I'd love to be able to tell you that the Jew first was recognized as a full citizen with full dignity and human rights in a Christian country. I can't tell you that. It was in 1797 that that happened. And it happened in France as the result of a revolution brought about by atheists and humanists who denied the existence of God and they gave you freedom, liberty, equality, fraternity. And Christian nations then tumbled over each other to climb on the bandwagon and catch up. I find it marvellous to see how God has kept his hand on all this. How when Spain and Portugal said out, at the same time, exactly the same time, three ships set off across the Atlantic. Led by a man with Jewish blood in his veins, though not a full Jew, namely Christopher Columbus. Discovered the new world and the first man to set foot on the new world was Jewish first member of his crew to step out of the boat was a Jew and they discovered a new world that was to provide a haven for the next how many years right to this present day though even there and I've just got back from America even there anti-Semitism is rearing its ugly head again well that's the story it's a shameful one Lord Balfour, who gave the Balfour Declaration, said this, Christian culture and civilization owe an immeasurable debt to the Jew, but it has been shamefully ill-repaid. That was one of the motivations that led him to give the Balfour Declaration in favor of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Well, that's the Christian story. We have been through an incredible experience in 1938 
A conference was called at Evian Le Bain on the shores of Lake Geneva with representatives from 32 nations called by the President of the United States to deal with one question What can we do to rescue the Jews from Germany? Already they knew the danger that they were in. And the President of the United States' as representative had the audacity to say, We can't take any more, but we hope the rest of you can. And one nation after another said, We can't take any. Britain said, We'll take some children, but not the adults. And families were divided. France said, We can take none. The only three countries that said they could take a few were Denmark, Holland, and the Dominican Republic. And halfway through that week's conference, most of the delegates were to be found skiing and sailing, and the hall was empty. Only a month or two after that came the Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass, and only a few weeks after that, the first document was circulated secretly, headed the final solution. Because the observers that Hitler had at that conference on the shores of Lake Geneva came back to him and said, you can do what you like, nobody wants them. And I wonder if World War II would have happened if we free nations had taken a different attitude at that crucial time. 1938, it almost looked as if that was going to be the end, humanly speaking, and indeed a third were to be exterminated. Yet ten years later, in 1948, David Ben-Gurion is putting the name Israel back into the school atlas. It is not an exaggeration to describe those two events or the intervening ten years as the death and resurrection of Israel. And neither Jew nor Christian can ever be the same again. It has put us all into a totally new context. We have had to re-examine our thinking about God and about each other. We cannot go through such an apotheosis of suffering and resurrection without asking very deep questions. If I may throw out one or two hints to those who think at this level, I believe in the concept of the suffering servant of the prophet Isaiah, we shall find the beginnings of an understanding. But I believe we shall all be led to an understanding which we did not have before to the same degree of the concept of a suffering God. That's almost a revolution to some people that God has feelings too. Yet I believe we shall not understand that period fully until we understand the suffering that God went through during that ten years. And the scriptures will give us the clue. Well now, what has happened on the scene since then? There has been a revolution. Two things have happened which really are extraordinary to all of us and we are still trying to grapple with these two things. Here they are. The first is... Christians are rediscovering their Jewish roots. And this is a whole new thing that has happened. I read just earlier today the statement of um, a Rabbi Robert Gordis who has made a special study of the contemporary renewal movement in the Christian church. I didn't know a rabbi did that. But he made a special ch- study of what is happening In renewal, you must have heard the name, the renewal movement in the churches all over the world. And this is what he said. The contemporary renewal process in the Christian churches may be described as the re-Judaization of Christianity. That is a perceptive comment. The Spirit of God has been sweeping through church after church and right around the world. There is so much evidence that God at last has had mercy on us again and is bringing church life back to life and giving us too our many resurrection. But so many effects of this have been to make Christians more Jewish. For the question the Holocaust posed of Christians is what happened to Christianity that that happened? What had gone wrong? Because unfortunately the church was largely silent in a so-called Christian country when that went on. That has put the church on the spot. At the very deepest I will tell you what happened, what went wrong. And you will need to talk this through and think this through with others to understand the full implications. Christianity was put into a Hellenic framework instead of a Hebrew one. That's what had gone wrong. 
and it had become paganized. And the very thought forms of Christians were no longer rooted in Hebrew thought forms. They'd become Greek. And the Greeks got it wrong. And the Hebrews got it right. And since World War II, the Spirit of God has been taking Christianity back into its Hebrew roots and away from this Hellenic paganization that had overtaken the church. I could illustrate this from so many angles, but let me just take one or two. Music. Whenever the Spirit of God is moving, there is an outburst of new music. That is why Merv and Merle get their songs. The Spirit of God, the Ruach of God gives them those songs. This happened in the time of King David at the peak of the history of the Old Testament. And King David just poured out psalm after psalm, the sweet singer of Israel. It has happened in the church too in the 18th century, Charles Wesley wrote 6,000 hymns and I think many of you know what happened when the Welsh had a breath of God upon them and the hymns that they produced. It is now happening again, but for the first time in 2,000 years, the Christians are singing Jewish songs. That has never happened before. The Spirit of God has never been able to do that or never chosen to do it. But now Christians are singing Yiddish and Israeli words and music. It's almost replacing Latin. (laughs) It's exciting. Something is happening. And if you Jews care to drop in on a Christian fellowship that is experiencing renewal, you will be astonished. You'll be amazed at what English people are doing now. They're actually worshipping God with their bodies. Amazing. Not just standing stiffly to attention like this. You'll find them singing, God has spoken to his people. Hallelujah. And his words are words of wisdom. Hallelujah. God has spoken to his people. Hallelujah. And his words are words of wisdom. Hallelujah. Does that sound like Christians to you Jews? That's how they're singing now. But it's far, far deeper than that. The Greeks always kept the spiritual and the physical so far apart that you could never get them together. And so you either lived in the physical world or you lived in the spiritual world. But the Hebrews said God made both. And they belong together. And the Hebrew puts it together and affirms life. L'chaim. Christians are rediscovering that most of the major blessings they enjoy were promises made not to Gentiles but to Jews. The Old Testament is being studied and preached about more than it has ever been in my lifetime in the last few years. The songs of Hebrew scriptures are now more and more being sung by Christians. Do you know one of the men who was responsible for this? Pope John the Twenty-Third. There were two major concerns in that man's heart. One was that God's Spirit would be poured out again in power on the church. And he would pray every day, Lord, renew your wonders in our day as on the day of Pentecost. How interesting that his prayer contained a Jewish feast name right in the middle there. But his other concern was that Catholics should get it put right with the Jews. And he prepared a document for Vatican II. And uh, it said far more than got passed. I'm afraid it was watered down by the cardinals. He wanted the Vatican to recognize the state of Israel. But to this day, the Vatican, it's the only country they do not yet recognize. But he did clear up a lot of misunderstandings. Let me mention, to be bold, one of the biggest. Christians have been brought up on an assumption which is somehow filtered through sermons and filtered through Sunday school teaching that all Jews are responsible for the death of Jesus. And that is a lie. Christians should have known better than to let that get out. If they had only listened to Jesus himself, if they had only read Matthew, Mark and Luke Gospels carefully, 
they would discover that Jesus said, I will be delivered to the Gentiles to be crucified. That doesn't mean that the Jews had no hand in it, because he said, they will deliver me to the Gentiles, but he said the Gentiles will do it. Now, I'm not trying to shift the blame, I'm just trying to say this, we were all involved. If any of us are involved, all of us are involved. Because here was a life that showed up the lot of us. And Socrates had said centuries before, if ever a really good man lives on earth, he will be killed. So it was almost inevitable. But none of us can point a finger at anyone else and say we wouldn't have had anything to do with that. We were all involved. Well, now this is one side of it, of what is happening. The other side of it is more extraordinary to us Gentiles. But again, I want to be honest and share with you our excitement. And it's this. Since the death and resurrection of Israel through the Holocaust and the establishment of the state, not only have Christians begun to rediscover their Jewish roots, Jews have begun to rediscover Jesus. Notice I didn't say Christians. Jesus. I just jotted this down, that since 1948... There have been 187 books, essays, articles, and poems written by Jews about Jesus of Nazareth, plus 223 other works, almost all of them in Israel, not in the Diaspora. More has been written about Jesus by Israeli Jews since 1948 than was written in the whole of the previous 2,000 years in the whole of the dispersion. What has happened? I find this extraordinary. And I think it is that as the church rediscovers its Jewish roots, Jews are beginning to be able to see Jesus without seeing all that the church was doing. And that is a major breakthrough. Let me quote from one or two rabbis. Let me quote, first of all, from Dr. Isidore Singer, the editor of the Jewish Encyclopedia. He writes now, I regard Jesus of Nazareth as a Jew of Jews, one whom all Jewish people are learning to love. His teachings have been an immense service to the world in bringing Israel's God to the knowledge of hundreds of millions of mankind. Here is another rabbi. If the Messiah comes and then turns out to be Jesus of Nazareth, I would say that I do not know of any Jew in this world who would have anything against that. This has happened since 1948. Here is another rabbi. We Jews are very proud of our Einsteins, Heinrich Heines, and Sigmund Freud's. We ought to be much prouder of our Jesus. And as a Gentile Christian, I want to say, Jesus is yours. Your Jesus. And I'm just so glad that you've been able to get past us Christians and begin to rediscover him. Here's another rabbi. He writes, Christianity and Judaism share one of the great reluctances of history. We are both reluctant to live openly and fully with the fact that Jesus was a Jew. Isn't that incredible? He is at the same time the most profound link between us and the greatest gulf between us. And I believe the time has come when we can be friends enough to be honest and say there are still big differences. They have whittled down to 48 hours, or to put it another way, Dr. Lapid, again the Jewish scholar, has said, whereas Christians and Jews were once at 180 degrees to each other, they are now at 90 degrees to each other. I like that. The important thing is, I believe that the ultimate unity between us will be found in this person of Jesus. If we both forget about Jewish opinion about him and Christian opinion about him and look for the truth about him. Because I'm not concerned what Christians think about him or what Jews think about him. I want to know the truth. And I believe that those who look at him and say, I want to know the truth about him will find themselves less than 90 degrees. 
Well, these are the two things that are happening. So there remain big differences. But the change in climate, in attitude, in relationship, I believe has been born out of that deep experience of that 10-year period between 1938 and 1948, after which none of us can ever be the same again. I must begin to wind up. Repaying the debt that we owe. Gentiles have a debt, and Gentile Christians have an even bigger debt to repay. How will that ever be repaid? I believe the answer lies first in attitudes rather than actions. Actions are not enough. And we are shrewd enough to know when actions are merely symbolic gestures. It will lie in the attitude of heart. And I want to say on behalf of such Gentile Christians as I know and relate to personally, we want to ask the forgiveness of all of you here who are Jewish that in the name of Jesus we did such things to you. We ask you to forgive us. We are seeking truly to repent. I hope that sooner or later you'll realize that the Holy Spirit has done something with us. A dear Jewish girl came to me last night after a gathering like this, a smaller one we had elsewhere. And she said, that is the first time I have listened to a Christian without feeling suspicious. I just give glory to God for that. And we want to come to you and say, we are just so grateful to you for being God's channel of communication to us Gentiles who were without God and without hope in the world. We didn't know. We blundered on in our paganism, our idolatry, our superstition. And you brought the truth about God to us. And we shall always be grateful for that. And we are at last discovering that Messiah is not going to come to Canterbury or to Rome, but to Jerusalem. And that the city which Abraham looked for, whose builder and maker is God, is the new Jerusalem. And when we get there, we shall discover that there will be 12 Jewish names on its gates and 12 Jewish names on its foundations. So not only do our roots lie among you, our future also lies with you. We want you to believe that God has done an amazing thing in some of our hearts. Until I was... 37 years of age I did not know any Jews personally I certainly didn't like any I knew about and I had no real interest and I managed to preach from a Jewish book for 17 years before that without it dawning on me what I was doing and in the late 1960s God graciously gave me a new experience of his spirit and his power. And almost immediately afterwards, I found myself watching television for six days on end. It was June of 1967. And as I watched the incredible events unfold of the Six-Day War, the Spirit of God within me said, Do you see what you see? Do you understand what you're watching? Here were these incredible, unprecedented historical events taking place before my very eyes. I remember going to the Galan Heights just a week or two later. There was still spasmodic fighting and an army major drove me up onto the Galan Heights. And I said, how did you get up onto these heights? When we looked at the Russian guns and, em and emplacements and the, the tanks, how did you get up these hills? And I'll never forget his reply. It was not in words. He just did this. <laughs> and by then I had come to understand that God keeps his word. There are many Christians who if Israel ceased to exist tomorrow would not be at all disturbed. They might be a little sad. Wouldn't be able to go next year and take color slides of the place. Or they might have a few feelings for the people. 
But I'm afraid the tragic truth is that the majority of Christians in this country have never been taught from their own New Testament that God keeps his word to his people. But I tell you this, that if Israel cease to be as a nation in the future, my faith would be shaken to its core. I've just been reading Harold Wilson's Harold Wilson's new book just out, The Chariot of Israel. And when he talks about the land of Israel in one chapter, he heads the chapter Eretz Israel, he just simply puts at the head of the chapter Isaiah's statement, the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. He shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. He knew his Bible from his childhood, as did Lord Balfour, as did Shaftesbury, as did Lloyd George. These were British politicians who knew their Bibles better than many clergy today. The result is they knew that God would keep his promise. Tell you why, because God hates divorce. Malachi revealed that God hates divorce and God married Israel for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. But he became a husband and he hates divorce. If God did not keep his promise to the Jew, I could not trust him to keep his promises to me. That's where my faith is now. So it is rooted and grounded in the restoration to the land of his ancient people. What about actions? What can Gentiles do as well as be to repay that debt? Well, to all Gentile Christians here, I say you have a duty as well as a privilege to pray. That really does work because there really is a God who listens. I tell you, this whole tent This whole meeting is the result of a lot of praying to God. Not just giving him a shopping list, but asking him what he wanted. So that when he wanted a marquee twice this size, look, every seat is taken. He knew exactly how many of you were going to come. And I'll tell you this, this has cost thousands of pounds. And therefore I hope you'll all go and get some refreshments afterwards. I don't want to be eating it all for the next week, so (laughs) you must go. They're beautiful refreshments, very carefully prepared. Unless you have really strong scruples, we'd love you to have uh, some really good Israeli recipes through there. Do you know that every penny for tonight's meeting has already come in? So that when we have an offering in a moment, every bit of it will go to the war disabled of Israel. Every penny will go. Because God himself gave us everything we needed for this whole evening before we had it. Isn't that like <laughs> We can pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They prosper who love you. But prayer is not enough. God expects more. He expects us to practice what we preach and to practice what we pray. I mentioned two situations. The first here in Britain. Anti-Semitism is rising again. There are swastikas on synagogues here in Finchley. There are other things happening. There are bequests to universities on condition that no Israeli student is accepted. Dundee has now been twinned with Nablus and officially linked with the PLO. We've taken the biggest cinema in Dundee and we're going up there to expose that and to deal with it if we can. And we've arranged a meeting in that university and I see at the back a a brother in the Lord who is arranging that. Here in Britain, we Christians are going to be called upon to stand by our convictions. And it may be costly. But in the words of a banner 
that was carried in the procession at the Feast of Sukkot of Tabernacles last October, we would like to say, Israel, you are not alone. We will expose this and we will fight this to the best of the grace that God gives us. We do not want anti-Semitism again in this land. Christians, you ought to be reading a book like this, The Economic War Against the Jews, which exposes the boycott of Israeli goods and the signing of agreements by firms in this country. A thousand of them have now signed agreements never to do business with Israel. Well-known firms like Plessy and Metal Box and GC and Ferry and I'm ashamed to say the Christian contractors Lane who built the mosque in Regent's Park. Then I think we need to be exposing this too. And I feel that we also need to point out that we cannot be neutral arbiters or peacemakers in the Middle East when we are already in the pockets of one side of the dispute. And the sad fact is that this country is now in the dilemma that we cannot maintain our standard of living without betraying Israel. That's the sad truth and that's the choice that is before us. In 1979, on May the 1st, I was in Tel Aviv dancing with 70,000 young Israelis in the square. Don't like dancing in England, but I'll sure love dancing out there. <laughs> I've got two left flat feet here, but get me out there. And it's a different ball game. But I was so enjoying the celebration of Independence Day and I went back to my hotel and I began to pray for England. It was just before the election and the Jerusalem Post said that uh, Mr. Callaghan was forging ahead of Mrs. Thatcher in the polls. I was praying for this country and I said, Lord, who are you going to make Prime Minister because it's your election that does it? You have the casting vote. Who are you going to make? And he said, Margaret Thatcher. And I sat down in the hotel room and wrote a letter to her. I want to be the first in the country to congratulate you. God is going to give you this high office. There are two things he wants you to know. First, he wants you to get back to the faith that your father had. He was a preacher in Lincolnshire. And second, he wants you to get in touch with Menachem Begin as soon as you're in office and get a good relationship with Israel. And then having written the letter, I got cold feet about sending it. I thought, she'll think I'm a crank or supposing I'm wrong. <coughs> now, I was staying with Mervyn Merler at the time and they said, right, we're going to wait. And if you're a false prophet, out you go from our house. <laughs> you remember that? You said that. You did. Well, that's Israel. <laughs> that's Israel. <laughs> but she graciously wrote back the day after the election. And when she moved into 10 Downing Street, you may remember that she said, I'm going to seek to live by the principles of my father. Do you remember that? And then she quoted a prayer of St. Francis. Two weeks later, I was coming back with a group from Israel that I'd led there. And uh, when we got our tickets for the flight back, all the group had British Airways and mine was El Al. And I said, you can't do that. I'm the leader of the group. I have to get them back home. No, can't change the tickets. I'll, well, can I change with one man who's willing to travel alone so I can get them back to London? No, not transferable. Your name's down for the El Al. So I got on board the El Al jumbo jet with Menachem Begin, <laughs> who was coming to London to try and meet her. So I was able to talk to him about her. <laughs> Isn't it beautiful how God organizes things? Now, I am aware of the political difficulties and the economic pressures that are on our government at this time. But Mrs. Thatcher is a founder member of the Friend, Friends of Israel League. And the question is not, who do we need most, the Arabs or the Jews on our side? The question is, who do we need most on our side, the Arabs or the Jewish God? That's the real question. For our future as a nation does not depend on the petrodollar, it depends on the grace of God. 
and it was my privilege to speak in Parliament last December at the invitation of the Speaker to members of both houses. And I had to say this, how dare we expect God to help England in our present crisis, in our present needs, how dare we ask him to help when we will give surplus North Sea oil to every member of the European community, to America, to Australia, to Japan, to Finland, the one nation whom we gave indications to that we would share the surplus with is Israel and we will not give a drop to her. And it was the God of Israel who gave us the oil in the North Sea. How dare we expect him to help us? For the real truth is, as God said to Abraham so long ago, those who bless you will be blessed and those who slight you will be cursed. God also said some other things to that man which I just want to read in closing because he said something about the Arabs too which Christians and Jews can overlook if they're not careful. So let me just read what he said. Here it is. He said, first of all, to Abraham, I will give to you and your descendants after you the land you are living in, the whole land of Canaan, to own in perpetuity, and I will be your God. Now, Christians and Jews must hear that phrase. I give you the whole land of Canaan to own in perpetuity, and I will be your God. That's what he said to Abraham. But now listen to what he said about the Arabs. He said, as for Ishmael, I have heard you, for Abraham prayed for Ishmael. And he said this, I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of twelve rulers and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac. Now we need to hear that. God has kept his word to the Arabs. He's made them a great nation. He's made them fruitful. But his covenant was with Isaac. And the covenant included the land. It included far more than the land. It included the blessing of God to be passed on to the whole world so that all the nations might be blessed. Which means that not only are Gentile Christians incumbent upon them to repay the debt by seeking to stand with Jews in Britain, it also involves standing with Jews in Israel. Coming out clearly in an understanding that it is by God's good pleasure that they are back in their own home to stay. There is greater trouble coming. The nations of the earth are to gather against that little land and you can see the scenario being set almost daily. Yet nevertheless, in the long term, God's purpose is that they should bring the knowledge of him to the whole world. Well, I believe I've said enough to share with you the burden of my heart. If I've said anything that was hurtful or inaccurate, please forgive me. But feel my heart even if my mind hasn't been right on all the time. Feel my heart. It is God who put that love in my heart. I certainly hadn't got it. And by nature I wouldn't have it. But God put it there. And he's put it there in the hearts of those who organized this gathering. They just simply wanted to express their love. It's not an evangelistic crusade. It's not a spoonful of jam with a pill in it. It is simply Christians who wanted to express their love. Bless you for listening. Thank you. David said, amongst one of the things he said, when he was answering the question, what shall we do, he said it is attitudes rather than actions. But there are also times for actions. And I believe that now is a time for action. The price that Israel has paid so far in the lives and the blood of her children has been a very, very heavy one. 
and at this present moment in hospitals and in homes <clears throat> up and down that land of Israel are many many of the flower of the country who have endured the most terrible injuries and as a sacrifice to the independence that Israel has, has enjoyed. And therefore, we are proposing to take up now a collection in aid of the Zahal Disabled Veterans Organization, an organization who helps to look after these young men who gave so much for their nation. <coughs> and as I ask the stewards to wait upon you, I would ask Merla to come and play to us. The following response is by Rabbi Hardman. clap so loudly before I begin, can you imagine what's going to happen when I end? <laughs> I haven't come here <clears throat> to give you a speech or to give you a lecture. I just can't believe my eyes. This is the first time that I've ever attended such a meeting. And for the first time... Since 1945, April the 14th, that I have begun to feel a little bit more optimistic with my fellow non -Jews. <laughs> For my sins or otherwise... I was sent in as the chaplain to His Majesty's Second Army into the Belsen concentration camp, where within a few weeks I buried over 35,000 bodies and bits and pieces of corpses. It was then that I felt that God wasn't there at all, Every time I shouted the psalm from whence I lift up my eyes to the hills, whence will my help come, another 50 people dropped dead. And it was there that I really believed that Christianity had died in the concentration camps. It was there that I met an army padre of the Hungarian army, soldiers of which guarded the outside of the Belsen concentration camp, living with his mistress in one of the huts, until we drove them out and placed some of these terrible victims. I went home And everybody thought I was going mad. I used to shout at people. I was walking on one, at one pavement, and across the road people were talking and laughing. I used to shout, how can you laugh? How can you be cheerful? When millions of people have been slaughtered, when a million children have been slaughtered, And I prayed for the death of one mother, a young woman, whose child was murdered in the most brutal manner. 
The Nazis and the SS were not pathological victims, they were normal. And this is the viciousness of it. They used to go home on holiday, take their wives and kids to the seaside, and then come back and plan new methods of murder. One of which was throwing a Jewish child up in the air and cutting it in two when it came down. How many bullets could enter the kid's body as it was being thrown up and coming down? And this mother was the mother of one of those children. She was insane when we talked to her. And it was impossible to believe that she could be normal again. I recall part of this Holocaust when I couldn't sleep. I sobbed my heart out every day and every night. And one of the majors and one of the colonels said, Padre, why are you crying? How can you help these people? They will be a blight on humanity. They'll never be normal. I said, sir, give them a chance. Give them a chance. George Bernard Shaw once said, the Jew is born civilized. We heard remarkable evidence of what the Jewish people have done. I wouldn't praise them so much. <laughs> as put. We were born human beings first. Envy and jealousy is one of the causes of anti-Semitism, Mr. Puss. Let's not ignore that. But then, let me tell you just one little story. A kid of 14, with stunted growth, he'd seen his parents murdered. He'd seen nothing else but murder and massacre for four years. And I wanted to create a sense of rehabilitation by suggesting to the inmates who were alive, you must have somebody in the world. You've lost your parents, you've lost your brothers, you've lost your sisters in Poland and Czechoslovakia and Hungary and elsewhere. You must have somebody in England, in America, in Australia. An auntie, an uncle, a cousin. Right and we'll send these letters. Many of them remembered and we wrote. Hundreds of letters came back and the order was all they've got to stand in file and come and collect them. I said no. Again, that's indicative of being under the Nazis. They've got their rooms, we'll appoint a postman and we'll go around and give it to them. There was a little fellow. I suggested that he should be the postman. How did I pick him? He was coming outside from the, out from the German streets and I was going into my billet outside the camp. And it was at that particular time when orders were given, military orders were given that none of these inmates should go into the German streets. We were terrified what they would do to German citizens. And he's coming in from the street, just where have you been? He said, I've been in the German streets. I said, what happened there? He said, what do you mean, what happened? I couldn't kill them. I couldn't kill them. What do you mean you couldn't kill them? Haven't you heard of the gas chambers? I said, I have. Haven't you heard of the crematoria? I said, I have. You've seen them at the end of this camp? I said, yes. And yet, he said, my Jewish conscience wouldn't allow me to kill them. I hugged that child. This is what I was waiting for. Had they dehumanized us? Had they animalized us? Had they brutalized our people to such an extent that we'd be become as savage as they? And this is what I was waiting for. And that gave me a little hope as to what the world was going to do. But all these years, I have been worried. We all Jews have been worried about our Christian friends. And with the rise of anti-Semitism again. But we swore on the bodies of the 35,000 we buried. That as long as we are alive we will never, never allow it to happen again. And we can't do it on our own. 
And when I heard Mr. Porson speaking, as I said, I felt a new man. I felt a new being. I felt there's a chance. We can believe as we will. But nonetheless, we're all God's children. And I trust, I trust that every one of you know Mr. Porson, not only pray, go into action. When you see anti-Semitism, crush it, speak about it, go into action. Don't allow it to happen again. And therefore I say it's been an eye-opener to me. It's been, as you were, perhaps God sent me, because it's most unusual so to speak, for an orthodox rabbi to come among people in, 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 this, in, in this man. I suppose I'm the only one here. Usually. <laughs> but, but I... A few more? Got, hello, yes, thank you. Yes, let us have more of these meetings. It's not evangelism. <laughs> Doesn't matter whether we believe the Messiah came and he lost his way again or you believe in the second coming. It's a matter God has given us a way of life and between man and man is so, so important. Relationship, love, affection, justice, peace, tolerance, understanding. It's a real marriage. And therefore I recall, it may be humorous, I don't know, but I was chaplain to the hospital in Dollis Hill, which has been pulled down. And I had in those days my dog collar on. That's a story in itself. <laughs> and, um, and I came out of the wards, and he says, Good morning, Father. <laughs> Thank God for my sense of humor, otherwise I wouldn't have been born. I said, How do you know that I'm married? Then he explained to me. <laughs> he says, the trouble with you people, he says, you've rejected Jesus. And he quoted, and I quoted him back. <laughs> We're getting on fine, but the time was getting late. So I said to him, do you know if he'll return, as you believe he will, he did know anything of the Catholic Church, he didn't know anything of a, of, a, of a Protestant church or a chapel or what have you. He only knew of a synagogue, but if he comes to my synagogue, I'll let you know. <laughs> As I say, my friends, it has really been an eye-opener. It's really been a blessing. And I certainly pray. I haven't got that method that Mr. Porson's got. I must find out from him. <laughs> he prays and God answers him. <laughs> I wish he would answer me so quickly. <laughs> There's a time for prayer. There's a time for reaction. And with this I end. There's two stories in the Bible. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, you remember, the Exodus, the Egyptian, they found themselves with the Egyptian forces behind them and the waters of the Red Sea in front of them. They were terrified, didn't know what to do. And suddenly they all cried out to Moses, What have you done to us? Wasn't there any, weren't there any graves in, in, in Egypt? So Moses got scared. He shouted to God. He started to pray. And the Bible tells us God replied, Why cry unto me? 
Speak unto the children of Israel, let them journey on. No nervousness, action. Two months later, they were in the wilderness and the warlike tribe of Amalek attacked them when they were weak and when they were tired. But there's no mention of God, of uh, Moses asking God or praying to God. What did he say to Joshua? Bechar lanu anashim, choose for us men and go out and fight. There is a time for prayer. There is a time for worship. But that kind of attack against us must demand positive action. Pray God that Israel will always be there. I'm confident that he will. God will not forsake us or leave us as our songster sang. Beautiful singing, beautiful singing. She's, her, song, her, song, her singing is beautiful as her face, no? <laughs> and so, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, sir, for inviting me and for let me allowing you to listen, listen to your wonderful speech. And may the, really the result of this meeting see an end to hatred, to anti-Semitism, to anti-Christianity. And so that the Almighty will say, I place you on this world to love it and to inhabit it. And let me end just with two or three sentences from Psalm 27, the psalm of confidence and courage. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God, my, so my Saviour. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not hand me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord.